Happy Mother's Day, everyone. <laughs> well, my last meeting was with the military air force base in Kelly, the Pentagon, and the community, and I tell you, I'm more frightened this time. <laughs> uh, well, the speakers have been just overwhelming. Um, I want to thank the organizers, and uh, just to say um, I'm a health economist, I work with the foundation, and I'm a resident alien, which I didn't dare say at the last meeting. <laughs> And I'm also of Maltese, which is mostly Arabic background. Um, I'm really pleased with the inclusionary definitions of feminism that have come up today. I've never called myself a feminist because of some of the reasons that Elizabeth B.J. Fernier outlined. I always felt I was too feminine and too family focused. Um, because what matters to me most is my family, my children, my love partner, my mother, my father, my hundreds of cousins, and, and all the plants and animals. Because if we have uh, the true definition of family, the biological definition is the whole community of life, the plants and animals too. Um, my other... Um, identity in Kyle, where I live, is the Lehigh Lady. My son told me the other day that in school now they all call me the Lehigh Lady because together with other residents, and we called ourselves residents, not citizens, <laughs> because I'm an alien, um, <laughs> we're really concerned about, and I think you all should be in Austin too because you all live downwind, um, uh, the emissions from Texas Lehigh cement kiln, which was given a permit to burn tires and began burning tires um, on January the 24th, and also burns coal, um, refinery catalyst, um, waste rags, oil, you name it, hazardous waste is, is gravitating down to the least regulated industries and the cement kilns are less regulated than your commercial incinerators. And so um, they actually are causing increased mortality. But the particulates, the lead, the arsenic, the benzene, these, these toxic emissions are molesting our children. And this isn't a rabid feminist that is saying, using those words, you making the analogy between military industrial polluters and child molesters. It's some even Republican environmentalists. Because what do to toxic emissions do? They retard and dull the mental sagacity of our offspring. They cause unusual anxieties and hyperactivities amongst children. Increased juvenile violence has been recently linked to lead emissions. They retard the immune system, um, compromise the immune system. They change normal hormonal development and functioning. And there are 3,000 children within two miles of that, that plant. And they reduce the sperm count and the ability to have healthy children. So I do ask you all to be aware of the most polluting industry in this area, which is Texas Lehigh, and join us on May the 23rd when we're going to be presented with another whitewash study by the TNRCC. Is this in Terrytown? Uh, no, it's in Buda. It's just off, if you come off I-35 in Buda, it's actually at the school where my daughter is, junior high. It's Barton Junior High, and you come off I-35 and go down Farm Road 2770 and it's on 7 o'clock on May the 23rd and Southwest Texas State University has also been involved in the whitewash and um, engaged their new environmental institute which is totally financed by polluting industries like Formosa Plastics, Exxon, etc. Um, so uh, I think that feminists, I submit to you that feminists should realize that we have no immunity without community action. Um, the other thing
the other work that I'm doing um, is on the military contamination, and I do believe that the military is the biggest polluter. Um, just north of Kelly Air Force Base, there's a Committee for Environmental Justice Action, SEHA. It's full of really wonderful, courageous, persistent people, and most of them are really sick. I was interviewing Mrs. Gutierrez. She's dying of kidney cancer. Um, her husband is dying of leukemia. And it was after we'd knocked at her door six times that they let us in, and the jet fuel tanks are just about 200 yards away from where she and her family lived, where she's raised, um, I think it was about seven children, and she has 19 grandchildren. And each of them came in as I interviewed her and hugged her and kissed her. It was. Um, so we are looking for volunteers to help us with that community health study and for you all to be aware of the big struggle um, just around Kelly Air Force Base. Um, they have millions of dollars to clean up the base and the surrounding neighborhood. But instead of doing what the community wants and doing very basic things like a $20 soil sample to see if there's lead in the soil where the children are playing. They're having these highfalutin plans where they bring down contractors from Oak Ridge and spend millions on these new techniques to decontaminate the soil with radio waves. And um, uh, so it's making, how can we make these people accountable? How can we prove that the health of the neighborhood is compromised? by their contaminants, by the shallow groundwater being um, totally contaminated with benzene, chlorobenzene, perchlorobenzene, TCEs. They admit to that, but then they say, oh, well, that doesn't, that doesn't reach the people 25 feet above. You know, there's all these layers of denial going on. There's this seam of toxic waste that they admit to, and this seam is somehow separated from everything else, and it's not spreading anywhere. It's not getting down to the Edwards Aquifer. It's not getting up. And so it's, um, it's, it's something that feminists, I think, should be um, uh, very aware of, and I'd, I'd like for you to all support the Community Environmental Justice Action and just listen while I read out the demands of the mostly women activists there. Safe drinking water, emergency evacuation plans. The jet fuel tanks, as I said, are only a few hundred yards from where they all live, and they've been fired on in by gang flying bullets quite often and uh, there have been spills. There was a spill just a week ago. Jet fuel has lead in it. It's not like other gasoline. So it's actually of more toxic, um, uh, has more toxic uh, effects than even the farm, the tank farm that was closed down to the actions of Poder in the community five years ago. Immediate cleanup of the soil and groundwater and air contamination compensation for lost property values, compensation for health damages, free medical assistance to victims, and a green buffer zone between Kelly Air Force Base and the community. Well, if I've taken two minutes to get this far, the US has spent two and a half million dollars on the military and military in, in production in that time. And this is over 70% of the total world expenditure. And this goes both on war games, like the ones that you heard about this morning where two Marines were killed, and on actual wars. And the latest war that the US was intricately involved in and has given millions of dollars, of your dollars, to mount was the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And I'd just like to read the, la the latest um, information I have from the Washington Post on one day in that war. Um, I couldn't count the bodies. Michael Lindvall, a UN official who visited the refugee compound shortly after the attack, said to an interviewer, there were babies without heads. 
there were people without arms and legs. And it was the Apache helicopters that were bombing that day. Israel has pounded towns and villages with 3,000 to 4,000 artillery shells and 50 to 100 airstrikes a day, according to UN estimates. There are over 500,000 people now from South Lebanon, civilians, innocent people, mostly women and children, who have no homes and no livelihoods. So I'm asking you all to please give as much as you can to save Lebanon. It's a non-profit, non-governmental and um, organization based in, based in Washington and I'm on the board of it and I can assure you that all the money will go to those in need. Um, I think when we talk about the military, when we talk about the US today, we have to talk about the military industrial complex. And if we look just on our doorsteps, we can see the waste, the contamination, the fact that the, the resources are used for this, dis destroy and penetrate enterprise for destruction, which could be used for creative, productive purposes. It causes inflation, unemployment, and a cult of violence. The violence that we experience in our homes, I think, is directly related to the fact that the economy, the, the US economy, the, the leading world economy, is based on violence. And our children today are being conditioned to kill. They're being conditioned to be indifferent to killing and to be part of killing. And I have a daughter and a, a son, and I can see it. I mean, I'm continually trying to unteach them these things with the video games and the mortal combats and you name it, it's there, conditioning to kill. But when you go out of the US and you see what happens, what, what the US military can get away with, um, my, my grandfather was sitting on his porch and he was attacked by a US Marine and he was never the same again. He could never remember anything but when he was from nine to 11 years old after that and he talked about that the whole time. It was really interesting but, and what happened to that US Marine? Nothing. He just got back on his ship and came home. And what happened to those US Marines that killed prostitutes in the Maltese Islands? Nothing. And so the lack of accountability, the irresponsibility and the arrogance has to, has to stop. Um, about seven years ago, we started in the Mediterranean to uh, get together as women. And now we have a, an association of women of the Mediterranean region. And um, we, we, we are meeting in, in, in June. Um, and we're not, it's not as, I'm not doing it on my own. I was at the beginning and, and it's just great. We're meeting in Cyprus, the women in Cyprus are calling a conference on immigrants and refugees in the Mediterranean. So I want to end just with our, our main demand, which, which I hope that um, would become a main demand of the women's movement in the US, because it is a main demand of most women in the world. And that is that we unite and denuclearize and demilitarize this planet. Thank you very much. I almost feel like standing up because I've been sitting all afternoon and I'm not used to that. I'm used to being very active and on the go. Um, my name is Sylvia Herrera and I'm with Poder, People Organized in Defense of Earth and Her Resources. And my title is uh, health researcher, health organizer, health activist, uh, health, uh, a number of titles. Um, what I'd like to, um, to address in my uh, five minute presentation, uh, first of all, I'd like to dedicate my words to all the women that could not be here today with us, uh, victims of, of violent acts uh, and other women um, that 
are working and cannot participate in this discussion with us today. Um, one of the things that, that um, unites us uh, is that we're all survivors here, um, either of uh, racism, sexism, or classism. And I'd like to look at that word just briefly, survivor, and look at the word in Spanish, and that was my first language, so a lot of times I go between the, the two languages or um, mix uh, Spanish and English. But survivor in Spanish is sobrevivir, which means survive, to survive. But it's, to me, if you really look at the literal meaning, it's beyond living, beyond, um, I guess, um, all the things that you've had to confront. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to just go over a, some words that came to mind in uh, putting together and listening to the, to the other speakers. One is respect, and um, several of the speakers mentioned that. That I think that if we um, look at respect, especially uh, to respect women from other cultures, other groups, other uh, groups with other different languages, that then we can begin to uh, dialogue and language is real important, uh, words are real important, and we have to be real careful when we use words. Um, and if you look at language, and I challenge you to, to, to look at another language other than your primary language, because when you do that, you begin to um, uh, develop a skill, and that skill is um, the skill of listening. I think we've lost that. Uh, along the way that we're not paying attention uh, to each other or listening to each other. So um, I think when we look at language, it has to be um, something that we have to be very c careful with our words. Um, for instance, um, a lot of times uh, you hear people say, uh, Americans, well, uh, America is un continente, no un solo país, which means it's, it's a continent. It's not just one country. Uh, people are from the United States, uh, but you know, there's other countries that are in the Americas. Uh, you hear the word third world. Well, as my compañera uh, Susana says, there's only one world. There's not several worlds here, and it's, we're talking about Mother Earth. Um, there was uh, one of the students that said, I'm, I'm unemployed. Um, I went to a party one time, and I was unemployed, and it was a very fancy uh, banquet. And so when you go to these banquets, people ask you, well, you know, what's your name, or what do you do? And uh, I was like, ooh, think quick. You know, what, what, what do I do? I'm an unemployed, right? Um, and I said, I'm a labor market analyst. And the woman said, oh, wow, that sounds very interesting. What exactly do you do? And I said, well, every morning I get up and I look at the classifieds. And she just walked away, just, you know, just really upset that I had l used language you know, <laughs> to, <laughs> to really impress her, I guess, uh, or not impress her after she found out. Uh, but I think, you know, that again, we have to be very, very careful with language. After we develop that respect, not only for ourselves, because that, that's really what we have to do first of all, is really come to that recognition of who we are uh, and uh, uh, where we're going. Uh, with that respect and then share it and uh, respect others. Uh, we have to go to uh, a redefinition of uh, maybe looking at, again, how other people have defined uh, what family is, what values are. And again, I uh, relate that to my own personal experience as a Chicana from the East Side. 
and that's the uh, view of extended family. And we have different people that come into our lives that are, are not necessarily related, but they still have those titles of things like tia politica. I mean, where did that come from? And politica is politics, but yet that's a word that's used for someone that's in your family. Uh, the other one is a madrina or padrino, uh, godfather, godmother uh, uh, people. Uh, in my own personal life, I've kind of extended that into my friends and, uh, and other family members that give me support with my children and other uh, women that have children, and we share that experience. And I think that, you know, that again is sort of a, a redefinition of what and uh, who families are of, uh, you know, asking Maria, uh, a younger wo a woman in our organization, what her opinion is or, you know, what I think or what she thinks about, uh, you know, how uh, I can relate or how I can um, talk to my children. Um, and then from there, uh, taking on uh, once we've, we've kind of gone over that respect and, and redefinition of families, taking on and the role of women uh, in these different areas, the role of, uh, of responsibility, of, of taking that responsibility and making that lifetime commitment, because that's basically what we've done, um, is taken off that life, uh, life commitment to uh, women's rights, to uh, Chicano rights, uh, to basic human rights. And um, I, you know, again, that's a challenge that, you know, people say, well, I'm in school or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. Uh, we've been able to uh, keep that balance. You have to have that balance. It's not an either or thing of, uh, you know, I can do it now, but I can't do it later because it affects us on a daily basis and we need to do it on a daily basis of making that commitment to uh, making um, this a better world. And from that, we can achieve basic uh, human rights. And so, um, with that in mind, and also just the fact that we do need to, once we've, we've come to take that responsibility to achieve basic human rights, then we need to take action. And part of that challenge to you is uh, to make a commitment to join us in an action that we're having tomorrow. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about the situation with the 800 women in uh, Illinois uh, in the Mitsubishi plant. I have a hard time saying that word. Tomorrow, we're going to be on the corner of Burnett and Research uh, uh, at noon to um, protest the conditions of uh, working women in that uh, plant. Uh, the sexual harassment that has going, been going on has been engaging in, in corporate scare tactics. If you've been following this, the story, there hasn't really been that much information. Uh, they're trying to uh, pressure the EEOC to drop the class action suit uh, that was filed on behalf of these women. We're also, uh, we'll be doing that again on Friday May the 17th at noon. So if you can't join us tomorrow, then make the commitment to join us next Friday. Uh, my colleague, friend, is in the audience, and she also has a flyer. So if anybody would like to pick one up and uh, distribute elsewhere, we would certainly appreciate it. They're out in the front. Um, but with that, I, I uh, again urge you and uh, request that you please uh, join and um, be active and be, be visible because we need um, to have uh, a strong force in these uh, different issues that we address. Thank you. My name is Maria Loya, and I'm with Poder, people organized in defense of Earth and her resources. And um, as a young Chicana, as a young Chicana activist, I try to reflect on the past movements, um, the past struggles. And one thing that I have recognized, and I believe, 
is that women have been the backbone of all movements of struggle. We're the ones that are getting things done. We're the ones that um, organize fundraisers, call people up, rally people to go to events. Um, one thing that I noticed in the past also is that while we, were, while we were the ones that were doing all the footwork, at the same time, we weren't getting the recognition. Um, when it would come down to press conferences, rallies, speeches, it was all being done by men. And as I reflect on that, and um, as I go through in my present situation as an activist, I recognize that in most cases it really hasn't changed. Women are still not being recognized for their hard work, um, yet we are still the backbone of the movements, but we are not being recognized. Um, I had one person tell me um, that that it was somewhat strange that um, I was really outspoken because of the fact that I was a woman, not only because I was a woman, but also because of the fact that, that I'm Chicana. Um, and I said, well, why do you, th why does that strange to you, you know? And one thing that I started thinking about is that, well, as I talked to my other um, sisters, um, one thing that I realized is that um, they have, we, ha we all have a lot of opinions, but in ma many cases we have to recognize the dynamics in which we are, and many women don't feel comfortable voicing out those opinions. And I think one thing that we have to do um, is provide some sort of support for young women um, so they can feel comfortable and confident and making them realize that their opinions are worth something. And they, they have to step out from behind and get on the forefront and get the recognition that they deserve. Um, and I think that this needs to go beyond the universities. We need, to, we need to go beyond having classes at the universities about women's rights because in reality, most people, uh, don't go to universities. I mean, we're totally leaving, leaving a, a big part of a population of women out of this, out, out of this um, uh, leadership training, out of this um, training to become more confident uh, on public speaking. You know, one thing that was mentioned by um, one of the previous speakers, yes, where, where are all the women from the barrio? Where are all the women that are constantly fighting? constantly fighting uh, the economic uh, oppression and the racist oppression that, that exist in, um, in the barrios. You know, where are these women, the, the fighters, you know? Where are they here? Do we give them a, a forum so they can speak out? No, we don't. And at the same time, uh, because of the fact that, that we consider them um, not being quote unquote legitimate le uh, women leaders. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just because of the fact that we don't consider them uh, legitimate women leaders, uh, we don't include them in the forum. Well, one thing that I'd like to say before before I end, um, okay, is that I hope that, that um, with this, there would be more support groups for our young, um, young sisters out there. And another thing is that, um, something that I'd like to say is that we cannot be talking about uh, women's rights everywhere when we know that women of color are constantly being attacked. Uh, one thing that, uh, and this would, have to do with the fact of population growth. We have to be very careful about that term, population growth. You know, we keep on fighting for our rights to, to choose whether we want to have a family or not, but at the same time, those decisions or those, um, that way of thought is being twisted around by racist people, where um, it's been all twisted around and people, women of color are being sterilized under the term of population growth. 
And in particular, like I said, uh, women of color. And again, this falls all into the anti-immigrant sentiment that exists in this country. And when we talk about women's rights, are we talking about women's rights uh, in, in Mexico and in Latin America? Or are we talking about women's rights just within the United States? You know, we have to think about, when we think about uh, family values, uh, yes, we're, um, we're talking about family values, but at the same time, you know, you have people supporting uh, the denial of education to children and the denial of uh, basic medical care, not only to children, not only to women, but everybody, um, men as well. You know, and we have to think about that, and I hope that you do uh, think about uh, not only women's rights within the white, within the white, um, the white community, but women's rights everywhere. And like my compañera Sylvia said, we have to respect everyone. Thank you, Maria. I gave you a minute uh, that Marta Cartera used. Uh, it's not my minute. I'm Susana Almanza, and I'd like to state that at one time we were all sisters and brothers, and the sky and the earth were our elders, and the parents were our leaders, and justice was our guide. And that's what we should continue to do, is have justice as our guide. I've never really belonged, what they say is a feminist movement, because one th for one thing, I've always had problems saying that word. I can say woman on my head, but my tongue just gets twisted. Uh, and because of my indigenous ways, I've always been taught that the strength is la familia. It's the family, that's the real strength. It's not whether it's a woman or man, because we know there has to be a balance. Just as we have to relate, there's one woman that hasn't been mentioned too much today, and that's Mother Earth. She is the woman that has nurtured us and has sustained us all of this time. And she is the one that's created the balance. And yet she's suffering, yes she is. Because as I speak today, she's being prostituted. She's being raped, she's being bombed. All their insides are being made for profits, that's prostitution. If they go in and they mine for uranium, for all kinds of stuff, for gold, that's the prostitution of her natural resources. And we look out today in the world and we see the prostitution of women. We see the trafficking of women. We see the rape of women and we see the neglect of women because it is a reflection of what's happened to the woman who is the woman of all women, which is Mother Earth. And when we see what is happening to her blood, which is the water, the contamination, as Jana was speaking about, the contamination of the water by these corporate, these corporations, transnational corporations who need no passports. We need passports to now visit our sisters and brothers in different countries. But these transnational corporations are, go throughout the globe spreading their destruction and contaminating the blood of Mother Earth. And we see that reflection within our own society. We see people injecting heroin, chemicals in their bodies, a destruction within themselves. And now we see that happening to Mother Earth too. It is a reflection of the woman of all women that it's happening. And we see what is happening to the air here, the lungs of Mother Earth. That's, that is her air and our air also with all the different contaminants that are going on in this world. And we have to speak up because justice, justice has to be the guide. That is the indigenous way. That is the way that we all had at one time. Justice was our guide. And we have to keep on that guide and not look focus, not lose focus of what it is. Justice is our guide, whether it's happening to a man or to a woman, to children or to Mother Earth, to father, son, justice has to be the guide. Because we now see that there's a hole in the ozone, which is the aura of Mother Earth. It has been penetrated by all of these chemicals that are unnatural, that have sat there within the Earth for such a long time and had not been molested for a reason, because they were not to be moved, they were not to be let out. 
because of the harm that it could cause. And we see the aura in us now. There's a hole in our aura too. And we're walking around all in balance here. We got all of these negative thoughts of whether, you know, that is a woman of color and that is an Anglo woman. That woman doesn't have a PhD. That woman fell in third grade, you know, doing all these comparisons, you know. And I think that that leads me into this other era of the paradigm that we once thought and of which was created along the time saying that if we got educated within these systems, that education would lead to opportunities, and with opportunities we would find success, and then with success we would have power. But I beg you to stop that now, because that is not, that is not your indigenous ways. The real indigenous ways is that you would obtain knowledge, and knowledge would help you get wisdom, and with wisdom you would get strength, and within strength within your body you would find harmony. That is the paradigm that we should be facing, and not how many PhDs you can get, not how many books you can write, or how many books you can sell, or how many stories you can tell. It's about obtaining knowledge and wisdom and strength and creating harmony, because once you have that within yourself, you will know that justice is your guide. You will know that justice is your guide, and all those other isms that are out there will fade. They will fade because justice would be your guide, and you will know you've gone back to your indigenous roots of what has been. We've had to come through so many trans transitions, and not just indigenous people on this side of the continent, but indigenous peoples throughout the whole world. Because like Sylvia said, there's only one world, but all of these barriers have been put up to us to think that there's a third world, there's a second world, and we're in the first world. Well, the last time I saw Mother Earth, at least here, yes, there's a lot more worlds, but here on planet Earth, Mother Earth, there's only one world. And it's only those that are exploited and most exploited. That is, the real, that is really what they're saying when they're talking about these worlds. It's just the exploitation of people and the degree that they are able to exploit people. And so I think that we have to take our back our way back to that indigenous route where we were all sisters and brothers and when the sky and the earth were our elders and our parents were our leaders and justice was the guide because we are lost now our aura has a hole in it and we've got to balance ourselves and we've got to close that hole in the aura of mother earth and when we become when we get that balance and we know that justice is our guide that aura, that hole around Mother Earth will close and we will know that we're on the right path. And so I ask you to follow the correct paradigm, not education that leads to opportunities that will lead to success, that will lead to power, because we've seen what that is, corruption. It's corruption, it's the exploitation of yourself and the exploitation of other people and it's destruction of what's happening. Follow the paradigm of wisdom, knowledge, strength, and harmony, and we will be on the road to justice as our guide. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Amy Wong Mark. I'm with the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. I want to take a moment to thank all of you for being here. So please make eye contact with the person who is right next to you and just give her your appreciation without saying a word. I have a story to tell. Um, almost 15 years ago, uh, a 40-year-old woman was referred to me because at that time she was suicidal. It took me six months to find out what's wrong with her. She had a very good job, very good education, but it took six months for her to tell me what had happened to her when she was 15. Uh, 15. She was out on her first date and she was raped and that was her first sexual experience. She went home, talked to her mother, and her mother didn't acknowledge the fact that she was raped. She took her to see a doctor and asked the doctor to pres prescribe her some birth control pills. 
And she said, well, the message that I got from my mother was I wasn't really raped. I was just sexually active, and she didn't want me to have children. And she said, well, ever since that day, uh, the relationship between her and her parents have changed. She took a week off from school, went back to school, uh, high school. Every single person in that high school learned about what had happened to her. She didn't tell. But the rapist told everybody about what had happened uh, to her. He was showing her off like a trophy. It was a long time ago. And she said that from that day on, I know. I know what men want is my body. So I allow my body to be used by men so that I can earn their love. But she said, I could not take it anymore. It is just too painful. That's why she wanted to kill herself. That was a long time ago. But today, in 1996, we still have survivors who are required by APD to take polygraph before they, can, they will take on their case. We still have survivors of, of sexual violence. They have to show that they are physically, they have physically, um, they, have, they are being physically attacked, have blacks and bruises to show in order for them to take on their case. It is very sad. In the Texas law, if you cannot show there's any forcible compulsion, that is not rape. The word of women, when we say no, it doesn't count. Here in Austin, an APD police asked a 15-year-old who was raped and said, well, you know, no doesn't really mean no. So what do you mean when you said no? It is 1996. So we have to keep on trying. Over 20 years ago, a group of radical people um, started talking about sexual violence against women in public in New York. That was our first Take Back the Night. Another group of people in California started the 24 hours hotline for the survivors of rape. That was how the 24 hours hotline was st uh, started. Today I would like to pay tribute to those women who dare to blaze new trails, who dare to demand justice. But they were called the radical feminist. Today, we have more names to describe feminist. We have the victim feminist, we have the feminist Nazi, and so on. But all these names only to serve one purpose, that is to divide us. So we must pay attention to people who use our language to divide us. I would like to share with you um, uh, part of the, the Zen Buddhist teaching. Uh, hopefully, that will help us in continuing to do our work, because our work is very hard. Um, the teaching goes like this. To our past, we must give our infinite appreciation because many people have worked very hard to get where we are. To the present, we must give our infinite appreciation. Otherwise, we'll be in such despair that we cannot go on. To our future, we must give our infinite responsibility. I once heard this saying, it goes like this, only the informers will see that this world is not perfect. 
I think we are all informers. But we must unite, get together, gather our strength. We are not just our sisters and our brothers' keeper. We are our brothers and our sisters. And I think that's what the feminist value is about. Thank you. <laughs>